Well, I'm so glad to be here, and um, I love Florida. I went to high school in Florida for four years in Orlando. My parents, I know it's a little bit odd, but my parents believed in Christian schools, and so some friends of ours were sending their kids to a boarding school in Orlando, and so my parents sent me. And I asked my mother when I had kids of my own, how did you do that to me? <laughs> I was 14. And uh, she said, because the Lord told her that if she would give me up, like Hannah gave up Samuel, that she would have me when I was older. And the pastor and his wife had a daughter who was my best friend at church my age, and they begged her to send her to a Christian school. And they said, no, we can raise her just fine ourselves. And she grew up and married a non-Christian and went on with her life. I don't know where she is today, but I think sometimes the Lord requires things of us, and we don't always understand at the time that we have to be obedient to what it is. And I'm grateful because it was a school that um, loved Jesus. Um, Billy Graham's daughters were my roommates or sweet mates, and missionary kids were my best friends and roommates and um, preacher's kids. And I grew, I got to... I got to be with that caliber of Christian in the era where they told us to die to ourselves, which went away in the recent years. <laughs> and we just came right after those five missionaries were killed in Ecuador, and Nate Saint's daughter, who flew that airplane when they were all killed, was my little sister at school. We had big and little sisters. She was a freshman when I was a um, junior, and so they hooked us up like that. But I felt... I realized that it was a privilege, you know, getting sent away from home may sound strange very young. I came back in the summers, but um, and I began to read books that I maybe never would have found, and they were by Amy Carmichael and Hudson Taylor and Elizabeth Kuhn and missionaries that gave up their lives and everything to serve the Lord. And they had such great one-liners and, you know, scriptures through their books. And I always felt like, just like these messages, God planned my life. And instead of saying, poor me, my parents sent me away, I, I sort of felt like I was at camp and having a great time with these kids all year. And I was taking in scripture. We had to memorize a lot of scripture. And, um, and the Lord was teaching me things. And I thought, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. But I do know that I'm going to need this for some reason. Then I, I grew up and married my husband, and he had been called into ministry, and I have needed it all my life. And the scriptures that have come back to me when I'm counseling women or writing messages have been key. And that's what I want to talk to you a little bit about today. I'm going to talk to you about, you know, how do we live as Christians in the world today? And my son, who's a pastor in, in California, in San Jose, Michael, he he wrote a sermon one time I was listening to, and it was, how do we live as Christians in Babylon? And I was thinking, that's what it is. And I want to say, how do we live as Christians in Babylon today? And then the other part was our time management. They wanted me to talk to you a bit about that. So I, I'm going to cover all that with what I'm going to say. So if you have any questions, come see me afterwards. If we have time, you know, it's going to be the next thing will be lunch. We may have a little bit of time. So... Um, I think that's at 12 is lunch, so, but I am here all day, so, you know, come and ask questions, and um, let's just pray before we begin. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this church, for the churches that are gathered here. I thank you, Lord, for these young women that want all you have for them, and I pray, Lord, that you would incredibly give it to them, that you would set each of their lives on fire, Lord, that they would not be the same as they grow in you. And we thank you for everyone. Use them in this day and age, in the world we live in. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I read a great book. I'm going to recommend a couple books to you, but one of them was by uh, David Jeremiah. Actually, I've been, I read a couple by him lately, and I really liked him. He's very simple. And he keeps it so you could hand it to a non-Christian, and they could understand it or a brand new Christian, and they could get it. And one of the books I read during COVID, what COVID was um, Signs. He talked about the book of signs. And he's talking about the signs of prophecy. And he goes through prophecy, and he started out that book by saying, what is going to happen to us? 
we are a world power. Well, we were about three years ago. <laughs> and, you know, we kind of ruled the seas. We were the people that jumped in, that helped everybody else that was hurting and in problem and in war. We'd send packages, and, and we were the world's helper. And he said, what happens to this world power? Because it is nowhere in this book. And if we're not in prophecy, we apparently are not important in the last days. So he said, what happens to us? And he brought out China, and he brought out Russia and Europe. And um, he said, we're, we're 250 years old, but what happens to us? We're not mentioned in it in prophecy. And um, when we look at our government, it was founded on, on the um, Bible. They wrote out our constitution by studying the Bible. They fasted and prayed in a church across a street in Philadelphia from where they, Independence Hall, and they gathered and they prayed over this. They couldn't agree. I don't know what it was over, but they couldn't agree. And when they fasted and prayed, they came back into Independence Hall, and, and in a few days they wrote our constitution. And it was based on this. And so we started out. We, you could not have a book in your public school in this country unless you taught the Bible. Is that a switch? Yeah. So you, I'm just saying that to say, we were here and we're here and we're heading down this road. And that's what I, I want to talk about a bit. He said, he said some things that were very interesting. He said, what happens to us? And he gave a few options and I thought it was, it was kind of fascinating. He said, we'll fall apart financially. Is that, could it be that? And looking today, that could be a huge possibility. Okay, we'd fall apart financially and so we'd have no power in the world we could go to war, you know, by cyberspace, our enemies could come. We'd live near China, where I'm in California. I, I think of that, you know. And so um, maybe we'll get attacked by the enemy. I hate to say this because you're young and you want to get married and have babies and have a life. And Jesus knows that. And so he knows each what you need and what he's going to give you. But we do have to look at this book and say, where are we headed and what are the signs of the times? So um, it could be war. It could be moral decay. We already see that. When you take God out of school, which they did in my lifetime, they took him out, and, they, um, and there's no value to life, and they introduced abortion. We don't have a soul. We're not responsible for anything. There's no prayer in schools. So what does this generation learn? This generation grew up without God. And it's just shocking when you came from the world I came from and the baby boomers, where everybody was nice. Most people went to church. And what happened to all of that? So when you have a moral clay in a country and you don't have to go to church and you don't read your Bible, you'll erode slowly and God takes his blessings off of you. And that's what we're seeing now. He's removing his blessings from us. But he said all of these things are happening, but what happens to us? And he said, let me just introduce this thought. Let's say there's over a million Christians in America. What if suddenly, in one moment, in one instant, we were gone and the Holy Spirit with us in the rapture? What would happen to this country? And all I could think about was the news during COVID when they were burning the inner cities. And I thought, that's what it's going to look like because it will be pure evil. And believe me, you don't want to be here. You know, when, when I was first in the Jesus movement and we talked about the rapture and Maranatha all the time, I thought, it sounds a little scary. I fly all the time, but I really don't want to fly through the air without anything around me. And if we're going up like that in the air, I mean, I was just young and, you know, I'm thinking, I don't know, Jesus, that just sounds a little scary. And I didn't know what he just spoke to my heart. And he said, do you know those moments when we're close? You know those moments when you feel really close to Jesus? He said, it'll be like that in a thousand times better. I thought, oh, I can do that. And now I'm older and I'm excited about this whole thing. And, you know, <laughs> take us any time, Jesus. It's getting really bad down here. <laughs> Many years ago, probably, you know, the early years of this country, 17 or early 1800s, a Frenchman came over, an ambassador from France, and he wanted to see what made America tick and why we didn't fight all the time. Because 
the French and the Europeans were always at war. You know, there was battles about religion, about everything. So there was all this going on all the time. And he goes, why don't Americans go to war all the time? And he came to this conclusion. Americans have a moral code. They go to church. They believe in God. And they govern and discipline themselves. Government doesn't have to discipline them because they go, we don't do that, we're Christians. We go to church. We do. And I think, look, look what happened in this time zone. And when that leaves, everything changes. So I thought that was an interesting perspective of our country. And I don't want to scare you today or make you feel, you know, like sad or depressed, but thinking that Jesus said, when these things come on the earth that are coming now, it's not quite yet time, but I'm on the doorstep. And when he comes, whether you're pre-trib, post-trib, where you believe he's coming, bef- you know, the rapture before all the tribulation or in the middle or whatever, it, it doesn't really matter what you think. He's going to do what he's going to do. But just know, I believe he's going to save you out of the horror of whatever wrath of God is coming. And this is one thing the books brought out in his new book called the um, Long Disappearance, is that what it is? It's Jer- David Jeremiah's book, The Great Disappearance, The Great Disappearance. And he's, he's telling you about the rapture and why and all the scriptures. And he talks about, it says that the wrath of God will come upon the earth. And we know that that is the great tribulation. All scholars would agree with that. And usually God takes his children out of his wrath. It's, I always think of Noah. His wrath was coming on the earth. And he took his children out. The one righteous family that was left on the earth, he rescued them. And we see that in scripture. He rescued Enoch before that time. And so God will rescue us. So I think he's coming soon. And how do we get ready for that? And what does that look like in our lives if he's just on the doorstep? Here's another book I'm going to recommend to you. And it's um, the author is Kay Smith, Chuck Smith's wife, who started the first Calvary Chapels. And the book, you can get it paperback. It's Pleasing God. And um, you can ask your pastor's wife how to get it. You can get it online, I'm sure. When I started going to Calvary Chapel, Don and I, we had come back from Bible College in England, and we, we were married just before we went. And we came back, and he was working in a little uh, church, a denominational church, and his sister invited us to this hippie church called Calvary Chapel. And so we decided, well, we'll go see it. And I just, I realized they absolutely were in love with Jesus. And they worshipped him. And the music, I wasn't a real rock and roll girl, but whatever they sang was spiritual. And I am hooked. And I'm going, they love Jesus. And we sat tight together in groups like this. And we put our arms around each other when we sang. And we just, and all these kids, and they were all your age. They were sitting all over the floor, all over the pews, with huge Bibles, and they were reading. And the reason they grew was because they read that Bible from Genesis to Revelation, because Chuck went through the entire Word of God, which Calvaries are known for, and taught the people. And they matured, and they grew up, and they got the whole concept and balance of the Word of God. And sometimes you're reading things and you think, well, this chapter is not so interesting, or, you know, maybe it's Leviticus, or maybe it's the laws, or what. And out of it, I have found even the most obscure scriptures God speaks to me that day, which I know He does for you. And that's why that is key. So that was first and foremost. So she loved the Word, and she loved prayer. And so I went to Kay, and I said, will you come to my house? I lived across the street, Don and I, from the church. And um, I just had one little boy at that time, and I said, could you come teach a Bible study at my house? Because I really want to know what you know. Because if I'm going to be a pastor's wife, or I'm going to be in ministry, or I'm going to you know, serve Jesus in any way or form, I just need to know what you know. And she came. And she taught in my house for a number of years till the city booted us out and we went to cross street to the church because there wasn't any room for the trash trucks to pick up trash cans on Bible study day. And so, um, and then it just grew like crazy. But these are the things as we sat at our feet, she told us, you may think they're old fashioned, they're basic to Christianity. And I wanna say, go back to your roots. Go back and look at it. Why were these Christians so strong in their faith? First, they went through the entire Word of God, and they had a devotional life. 
And she taught us, if you're married, to love your husbands and don't talk about him to other people. Unless you're getting counseling for help from, you know, your pastor or someone, a, a woman who can minister to you. But don't go and badmouth your husband. And I thought, that is a novel idea in this day and age, you know, because girls would get together and they go, my husband does this and mine did that. And you're not married yet. Don't worry about that yet. <laughs> but she said, don't ever do that. Just praise him and love him. Great advice. She said, don't watch junk on TV and don't watch anything that's demonic. And in those days, we had this little innocent show that was called Bewitched. And it was about this cute little witch who was married to this guy and had a normal family. And she said, think about that show. It makes it look really fun and really cute and really nice. Think about Harry Potter. You guys grew up in that generation. Think about that. It's all witchcraft. And it sucks you in to think that Satan's not mean and awful. And witchcraft isn't bad. And you girls know it is. It's destructive. Because why? Satan hates you, we heard last night. He really hates us. So she would just say basic things like that. She said, don't live on soap operas. They're not good for you. They're just trash, you know. And um, she told us to dress modestly. Because we don't always think if we just, especially if you just grew up in a female family with all sisters, you don't think about how guys think. And they think different than you do. And if you dress immodestly, you're causing these guys to stumble. And so she always said, dress modestly as a Christian girl. And, and so we took those things to heart because we were, you know, I wasn't <laughs> with these girls here. They were all hippies, you know, and so they threw away their bras and they, you know, whatever, and they dressed <laughs> like ever, and the short skirts that were, and so she said, don't do this. Don't follow the world. Dress sweetly and, and modestly, and the right kind of guys will marry you. And I'm old enough to know, I've seen that a lot, um, that we were to repent and she said, watch the news. I know what's going on in the world. I do not advise CNN to you girls privately. But, you know, I mean, I even watch Fox. But sometimes I have to tell you, it's just depressing. It's depressing. So I have to go pray about it. But she said, you need to know what's going on in your world so that you can communicate with people. And then also you understand prophecy as you see it coming. You know, they used to say, we're going global. Everything's going to be global. And if you read the scriptures, we're heading towards an antichrist that will have a one world government. It all fits. It's like when you know the word of God and you know prophecy, it's like, oh my goodness, this fits. They're going to put a stamp on us, our foreheads or our hands. And it's going to be 666. Don't ever take that. Those people will not go to heaven. They have signed away their life. That's coming down the pike. They're already putting tattoos on your animals so you can find them, you know, as far as, as, as chips in them. This is coming. It's already here in your world. So as you watch this, you have to become wiser and wiser Christian women. Um, she talked about being loving, and I felt very loved by her. She, her approach was always very, very compassionate and loving. And another thing I learned was how to hear God's voice. And we learn that through the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. And they begin to exercise the gifts of the Spirit, ministering to each other, hospitality, praying over each other. And those days there were absolute miracles, people receiving their sight. People that were supposed to be dying in the hospital came back and accepted Christ. And I could go on with story after story of the miracles, but we have that available to us today too. We have the Holy Spirit. If you have never asked the Holy Spirit to fill you and give you any gifts he wants, ask him, because he's just waiting. I always think, you know, back at the beginning, did God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit get together, and they said, who shall we pick to live in the last days? And they picked you. They picked your name. She will do. She will do this one. This one's going to be a leader for me. This one's going to be strong and witness for me. And then I think, this is just me, they're going to need help. <laughs> Maybe Jesus is, was here and he went to his father and he said, you know, they're going to need help. We need a whole Old and New Testament for them. We have to leave them a book of directions. And then Jesus said, and I need someone to help them understand it, so we're going to send them the Holy Spirit. Isn't that great? I think God's so perfect when he created this world, and you watch National Geographic, and you see 
how did God do that? I think I have stupid ideas like, I think he created the giraffe because the trees needed trimming on the top. <laughs> and then I think he, he made kittens for our houses because he probably made lions and thought they were so cool. Let's make little, little ones that won't eat people. <laughs> That's just my mind. I have this inquiring mind. Okay, we're going to move on. I read a book um, that uh, I, I think it was, it was by Ann Ortland. She was a pastor's wife in Pasadena for years, then down at the beach in California. But one of the, there was two words in her book that were important, and Kay brought this out in her book. And one of the words was concentrate, women. Concentrate, focus. Focus on God's word. Focus on your purpose and what you're doing, and eliminate. And I want to talk a little bit about eliminating, because um, when you clean your closet, you can find your clothes. Have you ever lost stuff in your closet? Oh, it's horrible. If you, you, know, if you don't want to clean, just turn on the hoarders for a little bit. <laughs> I've turned it on for my husband. He said, I can't take it. Please turn that off. <laughs> I go, no, it makes you just want to clean. And, and, and that's what I want to talk about spiritually. Get rid of those elementary things in your life that are not necessary and not are important and not distracting. You know, in the scripture, the Lord tells us to run the race and run it for the prize to win. And a person who's a runner gets rid of all the weight. Every, they strip. That's why they wear, you know, little tank tops and, and silk shorts and lightest tennis shoes they can find because they got to take off all the weight. And we gather so much stuff, not only in our closets, but in our lives. I asked my son, we were moving out of a house recently, and I told him to go get whatever he wanted. We had taken stuff out, and there was a few things left. And he said, I really don't want anything you have. And in the end, he took a pillow and some fake plants. And, and I said, why don't you want anything? He said, I'm a minimalist. So then I had to go to Siri and ask her what that meant exactly. <laughs> And so, so I, what, what they said, and um, it, it's first said it started with music and different things and artwork was a minimalist. But now it's in your world, and it's a word that's very popular. And what Siri said was, you have clear vision. You're not all over the place. You have a, isn't that apply to us as Christians? You have clear vision. And then um, you reduce mindless shopping. Not only in the stores, but on the internet. Mindless shopping. And you get on that internet, and your devotions are history because you have just spent 30 minutes in the morning looking at something you're going to buy. Mindless shopping. Beware and be careful. Um, decluttering. You know, when COVID hit, I thought, I need to clean my house. I have time. My sister-in-law called, and she, she's a neat freak. I love it. I want to be her. And she, everything is in order in her closet, in her drawers. She's always been this way. And she said, Jean, if you just clean a drawer a day, it'll be done. And I thought, I didn't do that exactly. <laughs> but I thought, what a great idea. In your life as a Christian, Lord Jesus, what do you want me to clean out today? What is in my life that is weighing me down, taking my time? Maybe it's worry. You know? I mean, I, I could go there. I'm worried about this and that and, you know, feeling sorry for people, wanting to fix everything, if I could just fix, you know, all the kids when they were growing up. And whatever that is for you, maybe, maybe it's just something that's very time-consuming, and the Lord says, get rid of it. And I think during that time of COVID, God separated the sheep from the goats because people that were serious about finding the Lord came to church, and they said, the world's falling apart. I want an answer. And our churches exploded, a lot of them, because they opened. And it showed me that there are many people still left in this country that are hungry. You have friends that are hungry. And sometimes we don't tell them. You need to tell them. My sister-in-law had a best friend that she grew up with named Colleen. They went to high school and grade school together. And then my sister-in-law was going to Calvary Chapel. She was on fire for Jesus and the Jesus movement. And everyone was witnessing. You'd go to the beaches, Campus Crusade. We're going down the beaches witnessing. And so she began to be very concerned about her friend, who was not a Christian, but a very nice girl. And one day she said, Colleen, do you know what it means to be a Christian? And Colleen says, yeah, you're a good person. No, Colleen, that's not what it means. You have to be born again. You have to ask Jesus to come in and be your Savior. And you know what happened? 
Her best friend started crying. And she said, why didn't you ever tell me this before? They're waiting for you to tell them. Many are, and we're just shy about it. But don't be shy anymore. There's no time to be shy. We need to, to reach out. I was at the airport a while back, and a couple in front of me in the coffee line were talking intensely. It was a married couple. And they were waiting for a coffee, and they had the suitcases, but they, something was wrong, really wrong, and I just knew it. So the husband took the bags and went to sit down while she waited for her coffee. And I just looked at her and I said, are you okay? I don't always say that with people. And she said, no, we're not. We have foster kids and the judge is going after them and if they go back to the mother, it's gonna be really bad. I just figured it was a drug situation or something. And she said, and the judge is deciding today. So we went to Disneyland yesterday just to get our mind off of this because they were in Southern California. And I'm looking at her and I said, do you know that Jesus loves those children more than you do? Far more. And he cares about them far more than you do. And do you know something else? He's bigger than the judge. And he can take care of this. And she just broke down. And it was so funny because she says, who are you? <laughs> and then she said, can I hug you? <laughs> and I just thought, thank you, Jesus, that I stepped out and said it. You know, you don't know. What do you have to lose? They can walk away, so we didn't lose anything. But you have a lot to gain. And right after that, I was sitting next to a girl on an airplane, last seat on the plane, empty, and this girl came in and sat there, and I just shared my dad's testimony. He was a doctor, and her husband in front of us was in medicine, and she says he can't receive Christ. She was a Christian because he can't get past science and all of that, and I told her how my dad did, and she said, I am going to tell my husband. You never know. Don't be shy. And in fact, ask God for opportunities. This is terrific time management in your life for what's really important. And it's how to live in Babylon as a Christian. You witness what is important. Concentrate on that. Romans 12, 2. And do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed. How? by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what is that good and acceptable will of God for your life. One thing I just want to mention here is social media. I don't know about you, but I got sick of the emails, not from any of you that were <laughs> talking to me about retreats and ministry, but it was ads. I mean, a store would find you, and you're on their list, and this would find you, and that, and strangers I didn't even know, even Facebook, mostly people I didn't know. And I found it was consuming my time, and then I found it was overload, and I went to my husband, who's the techie one, and I said, I want you to clean up my email. I must have had 1,500. It was 1,000 or 15. I don't remember. It was way more than I could deal with. And he just erased. I said, keep all retreats and pastors, and things I need to work and do, but I want you to get rid of all the ads and unsubscribe. <laughs> and it has helped me so much. It is a huge time saver. Be careful what you do. Social media can wreck lives. We've seen that on the news for the junior hires and the high school and destroying each other. And another thing social media does, it makes you want to shop. Makes you discontent with what you have because your girlfriend has more. You don't have enough money, you don't have the right car, you don't have the right apartment, you know, whatever that is, I need the right clothes, and it can draw you into this world, and if Satan hates you, he's seeking ways to rip you off, and he's very sneaky. Ask Jesus what you should focus on. It's so important. Become a minimalist spiritually, okay? And the key thing, and the most important thing, of course, is God's word. When I was in that high school, we, we sat around in dining room at tables, and you were assigned to a table for two weeks. And this one week, um, at this table, one of the fellows next to me was, I think, a year or two older than me, just a nice Christian guy. And, and I remember I had this burning question. And I said, tell me something. Why is it that people get born again, get saved, come to Jesus, and you see them three months later, and you would never know they were a Christian? And why is it somebody else gets saved 
and they're down the road ahead of you spiritually. They are on fire for Jesus. I said, what happens here? Why is that? Later, when I was really studying the seeds that fell into the different kind of grounds, when Jesus gave that parable, it really explained it to me. But on that day, I needed, as a sophomore in high school, an answer. And this is what he said, and I'll never forget it. He said, it's easy. Those that have a devotional life grow and those that don't, don't. And I'm old enough now to know that is exactly true. And that is why in the 70s, when Chuck took us through the Word of God, and J. Vernon McGee took you through the Word of God, and other you know, evangelical churches did that, these people grew. They grew spiritually. And that makes all the difference. And it gives you wisdom that you need to know to live in this world. And if you want to please the Lord, he will make you rich spiritually. And there's nothing like it. I remember I had a sister-in-law, not the one I was telling you about, but another one. She loved nice things. She loved jewelry. She's a hoot. I love her to this day. She knows Jesus, but she's changed a lot. And I remember one time she wanted her husband to buy her this ring because the neighbor was a jeweler, which wasn't working out for my brother-in-law. <laughs> but it was a ruby diamond ring that was quite beautiful and probably very expensive. And I remember we were on vacation together and she said, I just want, I want him to buy me that ring. I just, you know, I want that ring. And, and um, I was by myself and I, I, you know, was talking to the Lord and I said, that does sound kind of fun, you know. She's having a really fun life, you know. She lived in a gorgeous home in a gorgeous area of town and had everything. She was having a baby. I wasn't yet. And we went off to Bible college in England, and <laughs> it was a different world. And I thought, she's, she's got everything going. This is a happy, you know. She, and she knows Jesus. But when we went to Bible college, she said to us, I think it's really great that you guys are going to go in ministry, but I just as soon have all my rewards down here. And I have lived long enough that the Lord spoke to me and said, you don't know her end. And years later, I have to tell you that she and her husband lost most of the money in the stock market. And she's living in a small house that's very nice and adequate, but for her, when she lived in Prackley Mansions, it was a different world. But you know what? Now her big concern is that her kids love Jesus and one that's kind of backslidden, she's praying for all the time and in grandkids, that's where her focus is now. And I see God works those things in your life to grow you up and to make you closer to him because he's looking at you going, girls, we're in the last days. You better get serious about this. You better get into my word. You better get into church. And if you want to conquer the giants in your life, the Bible is your weapon. That's what Jesus used when Satan tempted him. What did he say? <clears throat> Scripture. All three temptations, Jesus answered, the word of God says. God has spoken. It's a great example to us that we are to answer with God's word. Second Chronicles 16.9 says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him just like the scripture we talk about. Those that love the Lord, that follow the Lord, all things work together for good. There was that phrase in there that was important. If you follow the Lord, you're going to have trials, like Joseph. You're going to go through those things. But he's going to use them to teach you. And it's really important. One of my sons I went to um, a year ago, and I said, something's coming down the pike, and I, I don't know what it is. But I just feel you're going to go through a trial. I guess it's one of those words of knowledge or something from the Lord, and I'm just going, I don't know. I just feel like something really harsh is coming in your life, and it's going to be awful. But this is what I see from the Lord. He's going to take you and make you deeper than you have ever gone. He is going to make you richer than you've ever been spiritually. And he's going to take your character and make you more and more like himself. Because we do live in these last days. 
And I said, the scripture says that when we behold him like mirrors, we'll be like him. He said, what does that mean? And I think it means when he comes in the rapture or we die and go to heaven, when we see him, we'll be like him. If we let him build our character down here, we won't be so ashamed at his coming that we were so fleshly and so worldly that we're so different that we're shamed. But we're going, yes, Jesus, all you taught us. It's true. It's wonderful. And it's your character and it will become my character. And then I watched the axe fall. And my son went through probably the worst trial of his life. And it was long and hard, and I watched him grow. He and his friends started a men's Bible study for businessmen. One of the guys even flew in from another state. They were heavy and strong, and it was from different churches. But these men said, I want to know. I want to know more. And so he got him Chuck Smith's book on living water, which is the story of the Holy Spirit in your life. And so my husband, who's going to be speaking next on, my son said, would you, Dad, come and just open up this book for us and do the first study? And he did. And some of those businessmen contacted my son afterwards and said, I never knew anything about this. Why didn't anyone tell me about the Holy Spirit? So those are the times we live in. And people that are hungry are really hungry. And when we go through those hard things, because God's using it. God's using it. I've seen my son grow tremendously this year. I've seen one of his children grow tremendously. He has a little girl, and she's nine, and um, I, you know, known her. I used to take her as a baby in my arms, and I used to say what Kay Smith told us, that the Jewish women say to their babies when they're born. They take them in their arms when they first start hearing, and they go, Jehovah is God. Jehovah's God. And I used to take Madison to the window. And we have a, a, a big window in our house looking at the garden. And I would hold her in my arms and we'd look at flowers. And I'd say, Madison, Jesus loves you. He loves you. And, and her mom, the parents let me sing her goodnight because they lived in our house for a few years. They were saving up for a house. And, and so I got a hold of Madison. And I go, God put her here for a reason. And I thought, she needs Jesus. And one day, she was three years old, three and a half, and I was taking her for a walk. They were moving out to their own house. And I thought, I just wish she'd accept Jesus. And I'd said to her before, you want to accept Jesus? No. She didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> so on this day, it was as clear as crystal. I felt like the Lord said, now, ask her now. I said, Madison, she's in this little pink cart in front of me. Do you want to ask Jesus in your heart? Yes, I do. <laughs> okay. So we prayed. That kid changed. Where she was, you know, a little ornery at times. She totally began to change. Uh, it was incredible to watch this. So a week or two ago, a couple weeks ago, she was at my house. Because uh, I take the kids once in a while, and it's so fun. So her brother's asleep in one room. He's three. And then her sister, who's seven, is asleep in the next bed. But before those two girls went to bed, I have twin beds in there, she said, tell me a Bible story where I do that. She goes to Christian school, so a lot of times she says, oh, I know that story. And I thought, oh, I like that Christian school she's in. And then I said, let's talk about the Ten Commandments, because I was watching people in this world fall. They don't think anything of white lies. There's no white lie, okay? They don't think anything of lying. They don't think anything of cheating on their husband. They don't think of all of these things that the Ten Commandments tells you not to do or being unkind, or gossiping, or all that, and I brought out swearing, too. She says, oh, yeah, I thought that was in there. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we're discussing the Ten Commandments, and then I, I put him to bed, and I go get ready for bed. Dawn was speaking, traveling somewhere. I came down the hallway, and she's in the bathroom. And I can tell you this, because you're all girls. She's sitting on the potty. I said, what are you doing? The light's on. She says, I'm pooping and praying. <laughs> I go, <laughs> OK, Madison. <laughs> Don't tell her I told you this when she grows up. And don't mention it at her wedding either. So she's just funny. And so I said, what are you doing? She said, do you want to know what I'm praying about? I said, yeah, I would like to know what you're praying about. She says, I'm asking Jesus to never let me fall away from him. She's nine. I went, she got it. She understood the Ten Commandments because I had said, if you follow these, God will bless your life and your children. But if you don't, you're going to have a rough life. I know people who don't, and they're just constantly in trouble. 
And so she said, I don't want to fall away. And I thought, tell the kids. Tell the neighbor kids. Tell your nieces and nephews and tell your children when they're born. They're never too young to talk about Jesus. And a child is far easier to win than an adult. They're not so set in their ways. And get them in God's word when they're young. It says to talk about them when you're on the way. You know, whether you're walking or in bed or whatever you're doing, talk about Jesus to your family and to the children. He said to Joshua in Deuteronomy 6, You shall talk about it when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you sit up. And I put, and when you ride in your car. It's a great time to talk to the kids about the Lord, to teach the children how great God is. Not only read it, meditate on it. Meditate on God's word. It changes your life. And it speaks to you. You know, so many times at night, I'll wake up and I'll think about the problems that are going on, and I'll just go, it's either the news I've watched the night before, which will give you a nightmare, or it's, you know, someone you're worried about, or a relative that's not walking with God. Something that's, maybe it's health or finances, and it's this problem, and I'll wake up in the morning, and I, I have one of these reading lights so I won't bother my husband. And I just stack up a pillow between us so he can't see the light and he just keeps sleeping. He used to wake up early and I slept in and we reversed. And I have a sign and I have right next to me, I get a cup of coffee and I have, you know, my Bible and devotional books or whatever I'm reading that is taking me through my devotions at the time along with the Word of God. And it just speaks to me and it tells me things that I have questioned in the night. Unbelievable things that we're so clear exactly what we're going through. And I just, I remember one time I was praying for my three boys. We have three boys. And I'm going, Lord, when they're little, are they going to grow up and love you? And, you know, and, and the Lord said, all your children will be taught of the Lord, and great will be the peace of your children. And I have to tell you, they're in their 40s and 50s now. And I have watched God teach them all of their life. And when they go through trials, I have watched God teach them and bring them to peace. And he gave me that promise. And he gave me other promises and things that, you know, he just showed me. And sometimes it was to help someone else. You know, maybe it's something about healing in scripture and you've got a friend with cancer. It's not always all about you girls. Sometimes it's about that person that's going to call you that day. But God uses this word. It is, does not return void. And I'm going to tell you something else. Memorize it. My dad was 90 years old, and he said he was memorizing scripture. He was brilliant. He was a doctor. He didn't have any Alzheimer's or problems with his mind at all, and he just had congestive heart failure. And so he said, I'm memorizing it now. I go, and he had grown up in Calvary, and, and, and he was getting the word, and he, he retired and went to Calvary Chapel. And he said, for the first time, I'm getting to sit through the whole word of God, like in a year, Chuck would go through. He said, I'm just loving this. And so now he's memorizing it. I go, how do you do that? I have trouble memorizing a verse now. I have to keep going over it. It was so much easier when I was younger. And you're 90, how do you do this? And I said, why do you do that? And he said, because it gives me peace in the night. He'd lost my mom to Alzheimer's. You know, you see your last house, your last car. All of those things you're saying goodbye to in life. And let me tell you, when he went to the retirement home, he still won people to the Lord. This friend of his, he got going to church and got saved, and he never quit. And he said, that memorization gives me peace. And those times in life where things are getting a little more difficult and you're getting older, memorize it. The thing is, you'll have it forever. When Don, my husband, was in his, I think it was in his 40s, he was on the treadmill and he used to kind that's of always, he used to run a lot, and then now he walks a lot, and he, and so he's working out. He's on the treadmill, and he comes downstairs, and one eye is totally bloodshot. I mean, right red. And I said, what happened to you? He said, I don't know, I felt really faint, but I said to myself, you slob, keep working out. And so he kept working out. So I took him to the eye guy, and he said, or the glasses doctor, and he said, you got to go to the eye doctor and he'd had a stroke in his right eye. And he lost most of the vision in his right eye. He can see, but it's, it's like through a shower door. The other eye compensates 
Our brain does that so he can do everything. But if I'm standing on this side of him, sometimes in a crowded room, he can't see me. And I see he'll, he's looking, you know, like, we're going to go now. Where are you? <laughs> and so, but, but during that time, when he lost his eye, he had been memorizing, started memorizing scripture like crazy. Like, we'd go to bed at night, and he had just memorized, like, three psalms that week, or five. So I didn't believe him, so I said, tell them to me. And he did. And I go, he just has one of those photographic minds. And so after that, sometime later, he um, got bronchitis. He didn't go to the doctor. He kept coughing. And a month or two later, he hemorrhaged. And it ate a hole in the artery in his lung, the bronchitis. And so he is drowning in his own blood. He's in a restaurant with a friend. This guy had a lot of medical problems, so he grabbed him and took him down to the hospital. Ends up, they had to take out the bottom part of his lung. They thought he had cancer, but it was a hemorrhage. And when he came to out of that, because we didn't know if he was going to make it or not, he went in and he told the doctor, he said, I don't want you to worry if you lose me in the surgery, because I'm just fine. I'm a Christian, and I will go be with Jesus, and I am just fine. And the doctor, who was not a Christian, said, took a hold of me, said, keep that thought. I wish all my patients felt like that. <laughs> <laughs> and so he, he came out of surgery, and he was in ICU. And his, our oldest son and his mother, his parents had flown up, all the kids had, had flown up to be with us in San Jose, California. And, and he was quoting the Psalms in an unconscious state. And it was comforting to everybody who listened. And remember, they were all crying. And that's what happens when you take it in and you memorize it and you learn it and you read it. You'll never be the same. You'll grow up. You'll be wiser than the people next to you. You will have more, um, you will just be stronger. And you will have the peace that you need. And just remember, Satan is after you. They've talked about that. He's sneaky and he's crafty. And this is the thing. He's a liar. He's the father of all lies. And he wants to kill and destroy and steal. That's what he does. So your best weapon is scripture. He lied to Eve, the first woman. What did he say? Surely you will not die. Have people died? Ever since. They died spiritually first. And then they died physically. So he's a liar. So ask for truth. This, this is a world today that is woke. And woke is lies. It is whatever you want it to mean. I go, what does that mean? When I went to school, it's like, this is what this is. And this is what the dictionary says. And this is what this is and this. And so I had to listen to someone speak on woke to know what in the world woke is. And he said, it's just really whatever you want it to be. And so to me, that just says lies. You can tell any lie you want and say, this is truth. And it's not. And this is the thing. God is the father of truth. God cannot lie. Satan is the father of all lies. And that's all he does. And you know that when you get into God's word and you read it. It's important. In this world of worldliness and greed and lies... The scripture my dad taught me as a little girl, and I've never forgotten it, was in 1 John 2.15. And I thought through the years, it was a great verse to teach a kid. 1 John 2.15, love not the world, nor the things that are of the world. For if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. Truth, pretty clear. So we're going to be minimalists. And we're going to focus more on what is important in life. Amy Carmichael, one of those great writers, if you ever get her book, she has great one-liners. She was a missionary to India. She never left. She was there, I think, 50 years. She went as a young, young person. And she gave her life for orphans and for kids and saving them in her ministry. She said in one of her books, how terrible it would be to live an ordinary life. Content with ordinariness, to be busy here and there, and to lose the thing that was committed to me. When God made you, he committed you to this era. And this is what he says, and, and this was what he made clear to me years ago. 
you're living in the last days. And I was at a time where I said, just tell me in this ministry, this church, you want me here one more time, because it was one of our more difficult churches to work with because it was $8 million in debt when we took it, and it was just all these problems, a different denomination. And so Chuck sent Dawn up to help this church. And, and people were leaving. It was 5,000 people years ago. It went down to 350 people, and half of them left when we came. And some of the Christians that came to visit said, let us know when you fix this place. We'll be back. And so I'm just going, you know, what is wrong with you people? (laughs) We came to help you. And just you walk out to that, just like, so bad. And I was really sad that Sunday, and I didn't want to talk to anyone after church because I didn't want to be a bad witness as the pastor's wife. But I was really sad. And so during the last prayer, I snuck out, and I went home, and I... We had this little rental, and I I put on sweats, and I just sat in front of the fireplace, and I said, Jesus, tell me one more time you wanted us to come here, which you very clearly had showed us. It was in the Silicon Valley. And the Lord began to speak to me, and he said, do you remember when you were in that high school at 15? Yeah. And I asked you if you'd go anywhere I wanted you to go, like I thought of India and Africa, and I said, I don't think so, because I'm not really fond of mud, mud hucks and bugs and... India, they don't eat cows, and I like beef, you know, and all of these things, and you need to be a British citizen to get into India in those days, you know, and I, I, I just even wrote Amy Carmichael's organization to see if I could ever go there and work as a missionary, and they said, you have to be a physical therapist to get in right now, and I wasn't good at chemistry, so I thought, anyway, Lloyd shut that door, but at that time, he said, you remember when you're 15, and the Lord came to me, and I said, no. And then finally, my girlfriend was praying for me because she was going to be a missionary, and she was praying I was going to be one. So I just went, Lord, let's talk about it, okay? Because you know I don't want to be uncomfortable. And I've seen now. I've been to Africa. I've seen the mud huts, and I've seen what people live with, and I've seen India. It's jam-packed with people and idols like you can't believe. And I've seen those places in the world. And I, I go, Lord, you know, that that isn't fun. I, I'm 15. I just want to have fun, okay? <laughs> and then the Lord showed me a picture of myself, and He said, "When you were born, what'd you bring with you?" And I said, "Well, nothing. Naked you come in the world. Naked you go out. I didn't have any money because I didn't have a purse when I came. I didn't have any friends. I didn't even bring any clothes with me." And the Lord spoke to me, and he said, and that's how you're going out. When I take you home, the only thing you will take with you is me. And I think of the souls you witness to and lead to Christ. And then he said this. I love it that that God asks questions. Go in the New Testament and read the scriptures where Jesus asks questions. I just love it. And he said, now what do you want to do with your life? And I remember thinking, if I was the richest woman in the world, Oprah Winfrey or Queen Elizabeth, I would never be as happy if I was outside of God's will as I would be in his will. And I somehow at 15 knew it. And I said, okay, I'll go wherever you want me to go because I know I'll be happy if I'm with you. So now in this church years later in my 40s, Jesus is saying to me, I said, do you really want me to stay here? This is so difficult. And he said, what happened to you? Remember what you said at 15? What happened to you? And I realized, and I told him, I got soft. I was used to a big church in Southern California, two cars in the garage. We even had a swimming pool in the backyard. And a regular paycheck. This church, we're not taking any paycheck for three years. And God put food on our table. It was incredible. Mm -hmm. We'd have to spend money on something, and a check would arrive from a church for the exact amount. It was great for my kids to watch this. They went, oh, my goodness. God is so real. He'll do this, you know. And, um, And this is what he said to me, and this is my last words to you, because you're going to lunch. You are living in the last days, Jean. The end is coming soon. I am coming soon, and you are in my army. This is serious spiritual warfare, and I have called you to be in my army, so you better suit up because we're going to war. 
and I'll never forget it. And I think we need to rise each day, Lord, suit me up. Like you put your clothes on, say, Jesus, cover me today with your armor, with you, with your Holy Spirit, and let me go out and do the thing that you've committed to me, to live in this day and age, to know your word, to witness to people, to be bold, and to love people. And let me just say this. I read this in one of the missionary books. Loving folks is the only way to win them. Don't tell them you're going to hell in a handbasket. They're not going to like you. You can tell them that if they need to be told. But you just love on them and tell them how much Jesus. It was his mercy that drew me, not the law, not the Ten Commandments. It was his mercy that made me really fall in love with him. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, I just pray for each one in this room. Lord, I know they're here this weekend, most all of them, because they want more of you. And Lord, we want less of ourselves. And so, Lord, we pray that you would do that. And Lord, I pray for these girls in this room that are single, that are going to be married someday. I pray that you'd be preparing that husband for them right now and be preparing them for him. That when they meet, it would just be perfect and from you and they would know. Don't let them settle for non-Christians or ungodly men. And Lord, just keep them and keep them strong in you. You're coming soon. Suit us all up. In Jesus' name, amen.